It's good to be back. This is uh, not the nerd night I expected to be at because uh, a while ago I was very excited to be speaking at Pi Day 2020 for Nerd Night's anniversary, eight years, and then all my plans were interrupted by world historical events. And that was cool. It's kind of the first time in my life that's happened. But, um, you know, since then I've just been kind of finding myself wishing for us to go back to precedent at times at some point. But, in any case, I was supposed to speak at the Nerd Night anniversary, but then a while later, you know, things moved on. Uh, you know, the world changed, and uh, you know, the vaccine came out, things looked like things were lifting up, and so I hit up Ricardo and said, Ricardo, I am vaxxed up, I am ready to give another Nerd Night talk, and you have anything going on? He said, sure, come to this one. So it's cool, because this corresponds pretty well with an anniversary of mine. Uh, specifically, uh, the anniversary of me remembering to plug in my computer. <laughs> so, Dramatic moment whether or not this is going to happen in time, but I'm going to distract you from Ricardo. It's, it's so easy to pay attention to him in that bodysuit, isn't it? So, there we go. Oh my goodness. That's okay. That's okay. So, anyway, we're almost there, folks. But we're nerds and we figure it out on the fly. Because if there's anything this two years has taught us, it's that things don't always go as expected. You got to be prepared for anything. And so, just like that, I'm pretty sure that works. And uh, now, all right. The spirit of tonight's talk, talk is connection, so this actually makes it a, a great prop. Anyway, on to something else. Um, so, uh, five years on August 13th, 2016, I quit drinking because, on top of being a nerd, I'm also an alcoholic. And by that I don't just mean, yay, I like alcohol, by that I mean I drank way too damn much for way too damn long, and it really sucked. Until, finally, one day I stopped. And I stayed stopped. I have stayed stopped for everything that has happened over the past five years. I have stayed stopped through the election of Donald Trump, <laughs> the presidency of Donald Trump, the non-re-election of Donald Trump, and everything that happened after that, which is fun. I have been sober for hookups, breakups, starting jobs, ending jobs, and this. By this I'm gesturing at the pandemic in the abstract. But anyway, the drinking part was terrible, and I would not wish that upon anybody. Um, but the sobriety part has been pretty cool, and so that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. And so, I'm going to start that story at the end, specifically the end of my drinking days, when I had drank my way out of jobs, relationships, completely isolated, and was doing literally nothing else with my life but selling my plasma and spending the money on the cheapest alcohol that I could find. It wasn't that I loved being drunk, it was that I hated being sober and I was willing to go to any lengths to feel better. Until one day, I was, it was like 10 a.m. and I was drunk, not surprisingly, and I was watching serial killer documentaries to lighten my mood. <laughs> Get out of my head a little bit, think about something fun. And that's when I heard the narrator say, at this point in his life, Jeffrey Dahmer was doing nothing but selling his plasma and spending the money on the cheapest alcohol he could find. Oh shit. <laughs> so, at that point, I resolved to stop drinking tomorrow. And the next day I woke up and resolved firmly to continue to stop drinking tomorrow. But until then, cheers to sobriety. But one th several thousand one last drinks later, I stopped, and I stayed stopped ever since then. But that moment taught me something interesting, which is that what matters isn't just like story, it isn't just facts that matter. I can't tell you how many blackouts I woke up from to see like Wikipedia pages about the neuroscience of alcoholism on my screen or something like that. <laughs> Facility with physical models didn't get me out of that. What got me out of it was stories. Now it's kind of fucked up, but Jeffrey Dahmer was the first alcoholic that I ever identified with. Where I was like, uh-oh, I see where this could go. <laughs> if I woke up to a fridge of severed heads, my instinct would not be to quit drinking right then and there. My instinct would be to continue to feel better about having a fridge full of severed heads. So I realized that there was one thing that was keeping me stuck. It was my, this idea of what's called terminal uniqueness. See, I, am, I do identify as a nerd, I do identify as a smart person, but 
what I made that mean about myself was that I had to be novel in order to be significant. I had to think of ideas that nobody else had thought of before if I was to be like a good nerd or like a good smart person or something like that. I had to distinguish myself from literally everybody, which I guess is an excellent drive. It's good to innovate, it's good to be original, it's good to do all of those things, but I took it to an extreme. And what I did was make it so that I refused to relate to anybody until it was kind of like bonked on my head uh, by a rather unassuming narrator one day on YouTube. And that's what I found a lot, speaking of the power of connection, is that a lot of what matters is who we identify with. And another thing that I kind of want to point out with kind of a slight tangent is that like there's a lot of other stories about drunks out there that I had picked up on. Um, a lot I identified with a lot of cool guy writers like Hunter S. Thompson, uh, Ernest Hemingway, Charles Bukowski, um, and all those, all those kind of guys who generate this image of being renegade badasses who play by their own rules. Now, they are really good writers. I do think their writing is awesome. But what I was not aware of and tuned into was like everything else about their life. Like what it felt for them to wake up at the crack of noon and how it, what was going through their head in the like two seconds it took for them to like roll out of bed and crack open whatever thing that they had to crack open to feel better. There's a lot of images like that. They're usually dudes. Have you ever noticed that? You don't really see a lot of like romanticization about like lady drunks. Those usually, they're usually like considered to be losers or something like that, but dudes, this is cool. I mean, our privilege is waning, but for now we can still kind of do whatever the fuck we want. Um, but what mattered to me was, like I said, it was the stories that I connected with and the community that I found. So I had bounced in and out of like traditional recovery groups a lot of times, um, but it didn't work for me because I was, on top of being a nerd, I was also like president of the campus atheist organization at UCF. And so um, traditional recovery groups are quite religious and that didn't work for me until I found a community of people who were secular but also sober. And that, from everything from there has been absolutely a fantastic experience. Um, what matters is that we are able to, uh, by this I mean like sort of the general we, we're able to see ourselves in each other. And somebody who has been sober for like five years might indicate that, might, might show how it can be possible to be sober for somebody who has no idea how they're gonna go to bed sober that night. But there was another thing that I kind of wanted, had to discover quickly the hard way. I was still quite nailed to this like idea of personal significance, and so I was very insecure. So I thought there was something that made me special and more better than everybody else because I wasn't drinking anymore, because I was sober. I thought there was something bad about alcohol, there's something bad about intoxicants. I don't believe that anymore. Um, well, I believe that everybody has their own distinct relationships with all kinds of substances. Some people have kind of an off switch in their head uh, and just like stop naturally. Um, and some people are out there who, they're, they're nasty people. They leave a third of a beer at the bar. Um, these people who pour half a glass of wine down the sink. Um, and I know I'm an alcoholic because that's alcohol abuse to me. <laughs> it's like throwing a puppy out of a car, the, the window of a moving car. I just like die for it and just like clutch it to my chest and teach it what love is. Not anymore though. <laughs> so what I kind of want to do is kind of illuminate what the recovery experience looks like from a secular, non-religious, nerdy perspective. Um, like, because a lot of the recovery experience is like, find God, God will lift you out of this sort of thing, which is great. Those stories move everybody uh, who, who, who glommed onto them. It helps them. But again, those resources weren't available to me. Uh, it just kind of started with admitting that I need help that even though I self-identify as a nerd, I, I identify as a smart person, I am not the only person with good ideas. I'm not literally the only person who like knows what's good in the world, who knows what's possible, all of those sorts of things. Recovery has been a very, um, I guess you could say humbling experience for me in that like I have learned a lot from people who previously I would have considered beneath my dignity. People like plumbers, people like the formerly unhoused, have a lot of very deep wisdom that I never would have listened to because they didn't articulate them with the proper vocab words. Um, but once I reached out for that help, it was there. And then from there, it's just a matter of, so it's, you, you identify that you need help, uh, you acknowledge that help exists, and you choose to go get help. Those are steps one, two, and three for you right there. From there, you go on to stuff that's called inventory. That's what step four is all about. You make a list of everything that you're like, that any kind of like open loops that you're stuck on in your head. Um, this, again, this is not like the only tool that's gonna work for everybody, this is just what I've had an encounter with. Um, something that comes up a lot in recovery is the concept of a resentment, which I find to be kind of interesting, um, because it's not just like feeling grouchy about stuff. It's resentment comes from, you know, but its roots point to like re and sense. Sense is also related to sentience, sense, 
um, all of those other words that are related. So to resent means to feel again. So basically if I, like resentments are just like stuff that I keep feeling long after the stimulus has passed. If someone cuts me off on the street and I get pissed, whatever, that happens. If I'm still pissed about it like two days later, that counts as a resentment. So what you gotta do is just think through, like and just take a look at your life and look at everything that you are still worked up about. Because like I said, it wasn't that I loved drinking, it was that I hated how I felt when I was sober. And I had to figure out why that was the case. And then you share that with someone else. That's what step five is all about. Now this was another very humbling thing for me because I thought, I went from thinking that I had to be like the most interesting and sophisticated person in the world to thinking that I had to have the most interesting and compelling problems in the world. Um, I wanted to have the problems that would like scare the shit out of anybody. Um, I wanted to believe that, you know, there might be hope for you, but not for me because I'm like 10 times as like fucked up and interesting as everybody else around me. Um, but then once I did this step, it was just, I just spent two hours and talked with somebody about like, here's everything that I'm feeling, here's everything that I'm screwed up about, blah, blah, blah. And he did not throw up. Uh, he did not punch me and like attack me for being a weirdo. Um, he just kind of quietly nodded and was like, yeah, I can relate to most of that. And that kind of just like popped my bubble, where it's just like, I have problems, um, but my problems are not the most interesting and significant problems in the world. If this person can deal with their problems, then I can deal with my problems, and that's great. And then from there, um, the, the next thing you're gonna, like we typically put in place in the secular recovery process is like figuring out patterns of thinking and behavior and constructing some alternatives for them. And this was one was a very interesting point for me because something I had to figure out was that like, Everything, all, all of my problems were ultimately solutions to other problems that I had. Every like messed up thing that I did, every impulsive action, every selfish act of behavior was there to meet a need of mine. Not just because I was just like a selfish asshole who sucks, but because like I was feeling insecure or I felt a need for love and connection and didn't know how to get it, all of that stuff. So there was, even though the behaviors weren't good, the needs and drives that were underneath them were fine. And I just had to identify what those needs and drives were and figure out alternative ways of meeting them. Now this was really weird because initially you talk about like all these like bad patterns of behavior and I'm just like, I, I, you'd think you'd be really willing to get rid of them, but it turns out that I was quite attached to all of my problems because they worked for me. And it took a lot of patience and compassion for me to get through all of that. And then once you do all of that, once you have figured out what was going on with you, uh, once you've gotten help, once you feel plugged in and connected, once you've taken some inventory, once you've take, put, put some new actions in place and started to get new results, then you get into the really scary stuff, which is making amends, which is typically going to talk to the people that you might have burned, that you might have hurt, that you might have stolen from, that you might have pissed off over the years. And some of it is pretty simple, just like if you broke something, fix it. If you stole money, give it back with interest. Um, some of it is way more complicated, like talking to your exes and like saying, I'm sorry, you were right. All of that sort of thing. And through that, it was a very profound thing because taking new actions created a whole new way of being for me. The, whole, the old person would never have said, I'm sorry, would never have like made it right, would never have done any of these things. But by taking these new actions, I got to become a new kind of person than I was back when I was stuck and screwed up. And what's better, I got to face everything that I was afraid of and see that it didn't hurt nearly as much as I thought it was going to, and then I feel, felt 1,000 times better on the other side of it. From, so that's everything from step one to nine. Step 10 and 11 are typically just about keeping an open mind um, and continuing to stay open to new ideas, new processes, new feedback. Um, when you're wrong, admit it, set it right. Um, generally be on active, be on the hunt for all of that sort of thing. Um, try to get beyond uh, the ego as best as you can. Um, I, I guess I should kind of mention, it's kind of okay to have a little bit of an ego because that's just what it means to be alive and to be a distinct like person. Uh, it, to be alive is to worry about meeting your needs and having some sort of self-preservation and not dying. Like, that's fine. Um, what matters is whenever that can blow up and start running the show, when you start hallucinating threats that aren't there, um, when you start um, acting for self-preservation first, um, whenever that's not necessar necessarily the best way to go about things. And so the best thing to do in steps 10 and 11 is to go beyond all of that. And then, step 12 is all about being a source of this experience that you've had. So you, you, you've done a lot of work to get connected, you've done a lot of work to figure out what, what's going on with you, why you did the, do the things you do, put new systems in place, take new actions, have new conversations, develop whole new ways of being, um, but then that all gets taken to the next level by actually creating that with another person. 
um, to serve as a source of that. And I know that anybody who's ever been a teacher of any kind, including anybody who's ever gotten up here, knows that you learn the most by actually talking about the thing that you're passionate about. You see what people are responding to, you get to ask questions. People illuminate the things that are important to you from an angle that you never could have imagined of your own private ability. That's what, what I'm talking about, what I mean going beyond your ego. But it also sets in firmly in place where um, it de definitely makes it so like, yeah, I don't want to quit now because I have all these people who like are really interested in my help. And so you get to go from getting the help to actually serving as a source of it as things move forward. And through it all, the one biggest lesson that I've learned um, in all of this is that there is a huge difference, and I drew, like, I didn't draw these circles, I just Googled two circles, and they looked great. <laughs> Served my purpose as well. One circle represents what happened, the other circle represents what I made it mean. Again, one circle is what happened, second circle is what I made it mean. And there's a, there's, you might notice that these two circles are not touching. That's deliberate. And I, what I kind of discovered was that all of my suffering is because I, I confuse those two things. Because I squish those two circles right on top of each other. And so whenever I've like found myself stuck and find myself upset, I have, well, often have to remember that what I make it mean is not reality. The human mind is an incredibly sophisticated, powerful machine for interpreting the world, for understanding things, for understanding ourselves, and it is not real. We are always, we always have our filters. We're all, always generating meaning out of everything that happens to us, everything that bombards our sensory system. We can't help it, it's just a part of being human. But a large part of what drove me wild for so long was thinking that all the stories I had in my head about who I was and what was happening to me were like the ultimate truth. And it became very hard for me to let those go because I'm a nerd and I'm smart and I love my thoughts. I love them so much. My thoughts are so beautiful and interesting and compelling to me that it's sometimes hard for me to imagine a life beyond them. But that's where the growth is. That's where the joy is. And so, ultimately what I found is that the stuff that used to happen to me before, all the drinking, all the misery, I used to, I used to make it mean that like there was something wrong with me, that I was a relapse waiting to happen, um, that I was a selfish, irredeemable asshole who was incapable of love, um, and that I would ultimately never be happy. However, all those things that, I, that used to occur as proof to me that I sucked, have become the key to me of a completely different kind of experience. Being a recovered alcoholic has given me community, it's given me connection, it's given me compassion, it's given me empathy, it's given me insight, um, it's given me an intuition that I never thought was possible. And so ultimately, uh, the past five years have like helped me transform not just my life, but what I understand to be possible for my life. So again, um, that's just, that, that's where I'm at. And ultimately what I get to discover is that there is something, I do have a choice. Because I remember that like there is not that, that what I make it mean and what reality is are not the same thing, I get to choose. I get to have a say in what I make things mean. And so ultimately, one of the things we always do is do gratitude stuff, and I fucking hate gratitude stuff. <laughs> no way. Be thankful for things? Fuck that. My life sucks. You don't get it. Weird, isn't it? Like where it's like, okay, great, well let's just put that aside for five minutes and be thankful for something. And I'm like, no, I refuse. I want someone to fix it. Like, you know, like I just want to be like a crying baby uh, for a month. Like if I cry and suffer like 10 times louder than I will, then like someone's gonna come fix my life for me or something like that. I have discovered the hard way that I, like why am I attached to my suffering? Because it does something for me. Uh, because it, it gives me clarity, significance, all of that stuff. Um, so ultimately what I've been what fighting to create is a, the opportunity to do something about that beyond just going back to my old coping mechanism of being drunk off my ass all the time. Does this mean that I don't think the world has problems? Does it mean I don't think that systems have problems? Does, it mean, does this mean that I don't think that I have problems? No, of course not. The world could always be better. Better things are possible. It just means that I don't have to be angry and pissed off and sad all the time about them. I can just face them with enthusiasm, motivation, and excitement to engage, to create, uh, and to connect with everybody. So ultimately, I did have to do all this hard and scary stuff by myself, but I could never have done it alone. And uh, all the communities that I've been a part of, both here or not, are things that I've been extraordinarily grateful for. And Nerd Night community has been one of the biggest ones. As Ricardo has said, I, I'm apparently addicted to giving Nerd Night talks, but I will not be changing my relationship with that anytime soon. Um, and so I've been excited for the past five years. I've been excited for the next five years. I've been excited for the past 20 Nerd Night talks, and I'm still excited for the next 20. Thank you so much for paying attention to me. Woo!
Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.